Um, the former White House aide, H.R. Haldeman, left us with an expression uh, for the ages, and when he said, uh, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, for Americans who <laughs> feel that, that uh, this is just a, a behemoth, that they could, there's no way they could have any control over it for Americans who long ago decided we're just going to have to live with this surveillance. How could it possibly be receded or rescinded or stopped? We can stop a program. Um, we can thwart an attack. Uh, we can make a device more secure. Uh, but as you imply, um, the system is still there. Uh, the institutions and agencies and companies that produced these attacks, uh, that are creating new methods of spying every day, uh, will still be there. The fundamental change, not just in the United States, but around the world, that has to happen is we have to stop thinking about the limitations um, on how data is used as data protection regulations. Uh, right now, when we talk about what Google and Facebook are doing, right now, when we talk about what the NSA is doing, right now, when we talk about uh, what rival governments are doing, what the Russians are doing, what the Chinese are doing, what the North Koreans and the Iranians are doing, um, we're constantly thinking about, all right, this data has been collected and these companies have it. How do we regulate their use? Regulating the use is a mistake. We should do that, but that's the wrong focus. It is the collection of data that is the problem. When you start trying to regulate uh, use, you're going, the collection has already happened. The collection was already legal. Uh, one of the fundamental flaws in US privacy uh, legislation is the fact that we are one of the only advanced democracies in the world that does not have any basic privacy law whatsoever. We have the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, uh, which is the reason that I came forward. But that restricts what the federal government can do. That restricts what the state governments can do. It doesn't restrict what companies can do. And as you know, as everybody knows, these companies are playing a bigger and bigger part uh, in the world today. We have to say all of these records that they're creating about all of us, all of this control that they're developing uh, from these surveillance programs, whether they're saying they're doing it for targeting advertisements or whether they're doing it for targeting killings, um, these records belong to the people that they are about, not to the companies. Uh, and this is a fundamental change that we have never discussed in a meaningful way, uh, broadly and publicly, but we have to because all of these governments uh, have said, you know, uh, the, the mass surveillance system, why do we have it? Why is it useful? They say because of terrorism. They say it's saving lives. They say it's preventing attacks. But no less than Barack Obama, in response to the 2013 revelations, uh, created two independent commissions to investigate exactly the answer to that question. Were these programs effective in stopping terrorist attacks? Uh, did these revelations cause harm to national security? Uh, it was called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board uh, and the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies. Uh, and despite having uh, an enormous budget, despite having complete access to classified information, despite the fact that they interviewed the heads of the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, uh, you know, the full alphabet soup, um, they found in the government's own words uh, the kind of mass surveillance uh, that's represented by uh, this bulk collection program where the NSA was secretly collecting the phone records of every American and everybody else around the world every day under an authority provided by a secret court order that nobody even knew existed, um, that program had never made, their own words, a concrete difference in a single counterterrorism investigation. Think about that. More than 10 years of operation in secret never made a single concrete difference. These programs, mass surveillance, is not about public safety. It is not about terrorism. It is about power. It is about economic espionage. It is about diplomatic manipulation. And it is about social influence. It is about understanding the actions of everyone in the world as carefully as they can, no matter who they are, no matter how innocent their life. I'm guessing Joe Biden is not your candidate for 2020. 
Actually, I, I don't take a position on the 2020 race. Um, look, it's a difficult position uh, being in the executive branch. It's a difficult position uh, being in power, and you have to make unpopular decisions. Um, I would like to think, having seen now in 2019, that all of the allegations against me did not come true. Uh, national security was not harmed as a result of these disclosures. Uh, but they did win the Pulitzer Prize for public uh, service journalism. Um, the laws were changed as a result. The courts said these programs were unconstitutional. Uh, we live in a safer and more secure world because the Internet is safer and more secure as a result of understanding these common vulnerabilities, which not just U.S. intelligence agencies were exploiting, but our adversaries were exploiting. When we close these holes, uh, we do not become more vulnerable, we become more secure. In 2013, it's fair to say, uh, some of these officials, some of these candidates could go, oh, the intelligence services are saying this guy's dangerous. They're saying this is a risk. They're saying this shouldn't have happened. In 2019, we can see that no evidence has ever been presented, uh, that the public understanding mass surveillance is real, uh, has caused any kind of harm whatsoever. No one has died. No terrorist attacks have uh, succeeded because we knew about this stuff. These programs work regardless of whether or not you know about them. Um, but we have seen the public benefits uh, substantiated year after year after year. Uh, and so I'd like to think these people would reevaluate their position. You know, there are government officials who would push back very strong on your assertion that national security was not harmed. You, you chose not to stop with your revelations at what was being done to Americans, and you got into America and its allies and perceived enemies. When we're looking at... Uh the reports that were published in 2013. It's important to understand, I never published a single story. Uh, the number of documents uh, that I revealed uh, is zero. What I did was I collected an archive of material showing criminality or unethical or unconstitutional behavior on the part of the United States uh, government. I provided this archive to journalists uh, who were required as a condition of access to this material um, not to publish any story because it's interesting. They could publish no story simply because it's newsworthy. They were only allowed, uh, as, so far as the agreement went, to publish stories that they were willing to stand up and say were in the public interest to know. Uh, and this is not some crazy fly-by-night organization. These are newspapers uh, like the Washington Post, like the New York Times, like the Guardian. Um, and in every case, this process was followed. Now, as an extraordinary check on top of this, uh, in case I went too far, in case I collected a, a document that was too hot, uh, or I misunderstood things, or the, jur the journalists misunderstood things. The journalists uh, were further required to go to the government in advance of publication, and they were required to do this at my request, and warn the government, this is the story that we're going to run. This is what it's about. This is what we're going to say. So the government could argue against it, to create an adversarial check on what the journalists and I were trying to do to reconstruct the system of checks and balances in the United States uh, that had itself failed in the government. And in all, because that process was followed so scrupulously, that's why I am so confident that no harm happened, no harm occurred. Now, if there are those in the government that say harm took place, if there are those in the government who say people have died, I ask you this, why haven't they proved it? You know better than anyone, Brian. Uh, that these government officials are more than happy to pick up a phone and make a leak to the New York Times every day of the week. Uh, if they had some evidence that somebody was hurt, if they had evidence that a terrorist attack got through because of this journalism, it would be on the front page of every newspaper in the world. And despite six years of history, that's never happened. Describe your life today. What is every day like? How are you supporting yourself? And, uh, and as, as a simple equation, if the Russians have reached so effectively into our lives and our electoral systems, they must be all over your life. <laughs> 
So that was several different questions. Um, but yeah, I'm sure the Russian government is trying to spy on me. I'm sure the United States government is trying to spy on me. Everyone's trying to spy on me. Um, the thing is, I don't cooperate with them. Um, my allegiance is to my country. My allegiance is to my constitution. Um, now, in my in terms of my daily life, uh, it, it's actually pretty ordinary, uh, which is to say it's not so interesting. I've always been something of an indoor cat, right? I'm, I'm not going to nightclubs and, and partying. Uh, my life since I was a child has always been mediated by a screen. Um, that's by choice. So not much actually changes in my day to day, whether I'm living in New York or Berlin or Moscow. Um, in terms of my work, which a lot of people are curious about, uh, this I think is a polite way of uh, people asking, do you work for the Russian government? Do you accept money from the Russian government? You know, are you living in Russian government housing? Are you in a bunker? Are there guards? And of course the answer to all of these is, is no. No, I'm not. Uh, what I do for a living um, is speak professionally, and, and now I'm actually an author. Uh, I have a speaker's bureau. It's called the American Program Bureau, uh, and you can call them and you can book a, a public event. I, I speak at universities. I speak at uh, corporate events. I speak at cybersecurity conferences to talk to people about what is happening on the Internet. What is the future of surveillance, and how can we protect ourselves? I'm very fortunate to have had uh, that opportunity, and it's meant that I've had a, a quite comfortable life in, in quite a difficult position.